Now, the Emperor Justinian, a medieval depiction of whom you see on the screen in front of you, has long been something of a preoccupation of mine, going back really to when I first had to write an essay on him in Oxford in the early 1990s, uh, an essay that had been sent by my old tutor, Patrick Wormold, who gave me the question, did Justinian ruin the empire he set out to restore? And in many ways, I've spent much of the subsequent 30 years or so really trying to answer that question, and attempted to come to terms with the emperor and his reign. As an undergraduate after Patrick, largely taught by James Howard Johnston, of whom you have a very grainy image there, I encountered Justinian from a primarily military perspective, thinking about him in terms of relations between Byzantium and its great superpower rival, the uh, Empire of Persia, but was also looking at the impact of Justinian's aggressive foreign policy on the empire's neighbors to the west, in terms of the barbarian successor kingdoms that had emerged around the Mediterranean over the course of the fifth century. As a graduate student, I then attempted to come to terms with Justinian's overhauling of the Roman state by placing Justinian's domestic policies in their contemporary social and economic context. Drawing on the testimony of the documentary papyri from Egypt and the legal and numismatic evidence for the empire at large. More recently, I have approached Justinian's reign from a more fully blown legal perspective, and increasingly from a more doctrinal perspective, assisted with some, by some wonderful graduate students whose interests have been often rather more religious than mine have tended to be. Now, over the course of the last three years, these interests have sort of come together by virtue of COVID, which obliged me really to find a lockdown project. With most of the libraries closed, I had to find myself a project I could get on with writing, drawing on my own resources. And after some hesitation, I was persuaded to set about writing a biographical study of Justinian and his reign, which will be published in October uh, by the US publisher uh, Basic Books. Oh, and I thought I'd given you a title page, and I haven't. Anyway, we'll have to wait for that. Uh, under the title, Justinian, Emperor, Soldier, Saint. Now, in my talk tonight, I essentially want to set out what I now think of Justinian and his legacy, drawing on my experiences of writing that book. For although when I started it, I thought I knew what I wanted to say, in the course of its composition, I found myself obliged to reconsider key aspects of Justinian's reign. And as a result, my view on Justinian is now very different to what it was before COVID struck. And I'll begin by setting out Justinian's reign in its broader historical context in very general terms for the benefit of the non-specialists present. The reign of Justinian has long stood out from the pages of ancient and medieval history for its energy, ambition, and drama. From the imperial capital of Constantinople, Justinian would rule over a vast domain which at the start of his reign extended from Greece and the Balkans in the west to the deserts of Syria and Arabia to the east, and encompassed not only Asia Minor and Anatolia, but also the fantastically wealthy region of Egypt, at this time uh, the most economically productive region in the entire Mediterranean world. Yet for all its apparent grandeur, the empire the Justinian inherited in the year 527 was one in which political circles in Constantinople were haunted by a profound sense of anxiety and insecurity, which the new emperor was determined to address. A chief, though not the sole cause of anxiety to some, was the fact that although Justinian claimed to be Roman emperor, sole heir and successor to Augustus and Constantine, his was of course a Roman empire that now no longer embraced many of the empire's original heartland in Italy, North Africa, Spain, and Gaul. These territories, along with Britain, had of course been lost to direct Roman rule over the course of the fifth century. Glorious and extensive though it was, the Roman Empire of Justinian's day was already perceived by some to be an imperial contradiction. And prior to Justinian's reign, chroniclers such as the pagan Zosimus 
whose work would continue to be widely read, had begun to comment on this fact. In particular, the emperor's claims to universal Roman authority were now openly contested by certain of the key barbarian or Romano-Germanic rulers who had carved out autonomous kingdoms for themselves in the West in the preceding decades. Now, certain of Justinian's contemporaries would appear to have been far more sensitive to the political ramifications of this state of affairs than others, but there clearly were those who were very sensitive to it indeed, including figures in the entourage of Justinian himself, such as the chronicler Count Marcellinus, private secretary to Justinian prior to his accession to the throne, who was of the opinion, crucially, that with the deposition of Romulus Augustinus as last emperor in Italy in 476, the Western Roman Empire had fallen. And personally, I, I would subscribe to the opinion that anti-barbarian sentiment was especially pronounced among men of Illyrian origin, such as Count Marcellinus, the Emperor Justin I, and his nephew and adoptive son, Justinian, drawing upon collective memories of the barbarian impact on their Balkan homeland. <coughs> At the time when Justin I had made his way to Constantinople in the late 5th century, for example, the region around the future city of Justiniana Prima, uh, whence Justinian claimed their family had originated, was probably in something of a no-man's land, contested between different warlords and authorities, a point that Alex Serantis has argued in his excellent study of uh, uh, the Balkans in the age of Justinian. In response to this, relatively early in his reign, Justinian would spearhead an imperial reconquest of Africa, Italy, and ultimately part of Spain. The reconquered territories is upon the map. These campaigns began in 533 with the daring decision to send an expeditionary force along the sea lanes of the Mediterranean from Constantinople to the Vandal Kingdom of Africa. With the rapid defeat and then capture of the Vandal King Gelimer, the entire kingdom passed back into Roman hands. The breathtaking success of this African mission would soon encourage Justinian to direct his armies into Italy in a concerted effort to restore Roman rule over that ancient heartland, the empire. This attempt, too, would prove largely successful, although in a much more drawn out and costly war. At home, Justinian cracked down on tax evasion by members of the senatorial elite, who repeatedly schemed and plotted against him to the very end of his reign. He recast provincial administration and also dramatically overhauled the inherited body of Roman law. Here, his aim was to impose order and clarity on the sprawling mass of legal texts on which administration and regulation of the empire depended, facilitating speedier justice and reforming the law to express one unified vision and will, that of the emperor himself, such as we find contained in his codex, the digest and the institutes. So effective was this act of autocratic fiat and codification but as the late Peter Burks used to emphasize, it is now extremely difficult to really work out in any real detail what Roman law was like before Justinian, with the emperor's law commissioners determining the form in which civil law would survive into the Middle Ages and beyond. Whilst locked in political conflict with members of the elite, many of whom resented his political as well as fiscal reforms, Justinian attempted to appeal to the broader populace of Constantinople by investing in lavish building projects epitomized by Hagia Sophia, and engaging in prodigious acts of generosity and clarity, as in charity, primarily targeted at the urban poor. But above all, as we will see, Justinian sought to recast the Roman Empire, transforming it into a much more fully Christian state in which religious outsiders, dissidents, and those deemed morally or sexually deviant were subjected to ever more draconian punishments. As churchmen deemed heretical were consigned to prison or exile, and as the emperor's many Jewish subjects found themselves openly discriminated against by state officials with imperial encouragement, it would have become increasingly apparent to many contemporaries that the accession of Justinian had heralded the advent of a more intolerant age. To some of his enemies, such as Procopius in his secret history, he was a demon. To some of his admirers, he would be a saint. But to a broader body of his contemporaries, whether they viewed him as a holy emperor or a demon king, it would have been clear 
Justinian was a ruler of remarkable vision and drive. Now it is often emphasized that Justinian helps to lay the foundations for the world of Orthodox Byzantium as it took shape in the centuries ahead. In many ways, however, his achievement was more fundamental than that. In his recasting of the Roman state as an Orthodox Republic, as he describes it in one of the laws to which we will return, Justinian ultimately laid the ideological and psychological foundations for medieval Christendom as a whole, as well as bequeathing a major legacy to the Islamic world that emerged in the Near East in the 7th and 8th centuries. In each case, the legacy of Justinianic law would inform how rulers interacted with their subjects, and in particular, how they treated religious minorities. Many of the great persecutions we associate with the world of medieval Christendom, for example, were, in a fundamental sense, informed by what we used to think of as the rediscovery and renewed application of Justinianic Roman law. On a much more general level, through his energetic reform program and no less energetic self-glorification, Justinian recast what it meant to rule, providing a model of statecraft to which future Byzantine emperors, medieval kings, Muslim caliphs, and Ottoman sultans would come to aspire. Now, to date, many English language studies of Justinian in particular have tended to focus on his external military policies and adventures rather than his internal reforms, by virtue of the fact generally that historians have often tended to be more familiar with the sources on which we depend for the military history of Justinian's reign than with the legal uh, and religious sources, which tend to reveal his broader and deeper policy agenda. Thus, the contemporary historian Procopius' uh, history of the wars still tends to inform approaches to him far more than either the emperor's vast body of legislation or the theological works to which Justinian contributed. And one thing I've really come to appreciate in the writing of my book is how correct Avril Cameron was to warn us in the 1980s against adopting too Procopian and classicizing a perspective. As a result, few have successfully synthesized, I would suggest, these different aspects of the reign as a whole. Likewise, with the exception of the late Tony Honoré, I would suggest that scholars have been too hesitant in attempting to draw out the emperor's personality and to examine the interaction between Justinian's personal vision of empire and the policy agenda that he so actively pursued, and which we can trace across the military, legal, religious, and domestic spheres. Yet especially through his legal works and his theological interventions, the emperor's personal voice comes across much more clearly and consistently in our sources than has often been supposed. Of course, we cannot write a modern style biography of any ancient but as Julia Hillner has emphasized in her wonderful recent book on Constantine's mother Helena, that does not mean we cannot write biography at all, and we can certainly write the biography of a reign. The legal and theological sources in particular enable us to catch, for example, the urgent tone of Justinian's unremitting insistence on the need to elicit divine favor, his constant impatience, his tendency to infuse even the most mundane of administrative tasks with spiritual and religious significance, his obsession with detail, and his close personal dependence on his consort, the Empress Theodora, so strong that after her death in 548, both his focus and his grip on power would initially begin to drift and loosen until we focused. The age of Justinian was her age too. The same sources reveal Justinian's determination to crush his opponents, and his blistering contempt for those seemingly oblivious to the virtues and superiority of imperial Christianity. At the same time, the Empress legislation, particularly contained in his so-called novels, his post-codificatory laws, reveal a man moved by genuine sympathy for the claims of the poor, the needs of orphans, the physically handicapped, slaves, agricultural workers, and seemingly, with his wife's encouragement, the vulnerability of many women such as widows or country girls trafficked to Constantinople for the purposes of prostitution. The emperor's social legislation was in many ways what we would think of today as relatively liberal, addressing the concerns of many whom Roman law had hitherto tended to overlook. In terms of his own self-representation and interests, Justinian was an emperor 
immersed in a minutiae of administration of law, a soldier committed to the expansion and defense of the Roman realm, despite his own <laughs> apparent lack of frontline military experience, and a pious Christian preoccupied with the definition and propagation of what he regarded as the true faith. In the church of San Vitale in Ravenna, there famously stands a magnificent mosaic dated from the 6th century, depicting Justinian in procession with his courtiers, adjacent to an equally magnificent mosaic of Theodora and hers. This portrait of Justinian is the most famous image that we have of the man. As Justinian stares out from the walls of the church, it is easy for the viewer to be mesmerized by the radiance of the imperial diadem or the splendor of the emperor's bejeweled raiment. Yet the gold, silver, and other luminous tesserae of which the crown, robes, and visage of the emperor are composed primarily stand out and captivate by virtue of the dark, darker fragments of framework. Likewise, in order to understand Justinian and come to terms with not just his reign, but also with the person of the emperor himself, we have to appreciate both the light and the dark of which he and his age were composed. For a reign of unprecedented charity was also marked by a similarly unprecedented degree of intolerance and cruelty, motivated by the same Christian principles. And the emperor's strong sense of providential mission and commitment to what he perceived to be the common good were matched by strongly autocratic tendencies and his keen and often prickly sense of his own dignity and pride, which repeatedly come across from the sources. As I've just indicated, Justinian's military ventures and foreign policy uh, uh, forays typically loom large in accounts of his reign. And this is not of itself unreasonable. All Roman emperors felt under an obligation to defend and where practicable to extend the frontiers of the Roman state, and Justinian was no exception. But the Western campaigns, which so often capture the imagination of Western historians, are large, were largely exercises in opportunistic imperialism taking advantage of a series of internal political crises in the kingdoms of Africa, Italy, and Spain, to which Justinian responded. These were opportunities which Justinian was fortunate to be presented with, and were in certain respects probably resultant from crises which he and his uncle, the Emperor Justin I, had deliberately helped to foster. But we have almost no indication of any great plan to reconquer the West as a whole, on which Justin, on Justinian's part, such as is sometimes supposed. The commitment of military resources to the West was always limited, and Justinian's chief commander for most of these campaigns, Belisarius, tended to be entrusted with a relatively flexible mandate when he was sent out against the empire's barbarian enemies to the West, adjusting both justifications for war and the extent of the empire's military ambitions in the light of what he encountered on the ground. I think more problematic is a tendency one sometimes encounters in the secondary literature to judge the success or otherwise of Justinian's reign in terms of the subsequent military fortunes of the empire in general and the reconquered territories in particular after Justinian died. By the time of Justinian's death in 565, as I mentioned earlier, his armies had reconquered Italy, Africa, and Spain, parts of Spain, rather. And these sustaining authorities have been obliged to acknowledge Roman overlordship of these strategically vital West Caucasian kingdom of Lazica. By the 570s, however, much of northern Italy had come to be overrun by a new barbarian threat in the form of the Lombards. By the end of the 620s, East Roman forces had been driven out of Spain, and Roman territories in Africa, as well as Egypt, Syria, and Palestine, would succumb to the Arabs over the course of the 7th century. At the same time, the reigns of Justinian's successors would witness <coughs> growing fiscal frailty on the part of the East Roman state, which would in turn lead to military unrest, growing political instability, and ultimately a bloody civil war, which would open the way to invasion by the Persians, thereby effectively preparing the ground, as it were, for the Arabs. Now, it's long been common for historians to try to establish some sort of causal connection between Justinian's imperial expansion and the subsequent era of imperial collapse. It was the point of the essay on the set in Oxford in 1991 after all. No such connection, however, has ever really been plausibly established. The fiscal and military exhaustion of the empire, for example, is far more likely 
to have been the result of the devastating bubonic plague, which first struck the empire in the 540s and which would continue down to the 8th century. Here you have uh, on the screen some victims of the bubonic plague from um, uh, a 6th century burial site in Cambridgeshire at the site of Edix Hill, looking increasingly likely that, this burial, that these burials date from the 540s. And there are more uh, such uh, discoveries that one can look at. Likewise, the Lombard invasions were ultimately the result of a reconfiguration of power in Central Asia in the mid 6th century which had led to the westward migration of the Avars, the consolidation of whose power as the north of the Danube would encourage both Lombards and Slavs to cross into imperial territory in Italy and the Balkans, respectively. There is nothing, realistically, that Justinian could have done to prevent either the plague or the Avar migration. But I think, still more problematically, overemphasizing the relatively short-lived nature of Justinian's revival of imperial fortunes in the West when thinking about the legacy of his reign, is to misunderstand where those wars of reconquest stood in terms of Justinian's list of priorities. As I've already indicated, the Western campaigns would appear to have been largely opportunistic and were in many ways campaigns on the cheap. Indeed, in the aftermath of the first advent of the Bubonic plague and in the death of the Empress Theodora in 548, Justinian's generals in Italy feared that the emperor had simply lost interest in them. As Roger Scott has repeatedly emphasised, Justinian did not immediately send troops to the West upon ascending the throne in 527. Rather, the African campaign had to wait some six years and was only launched after Justinian had survived the Nica riots of 532, which had almost driven him from the throne. The timing of the campaign, in other words, may have been informed not only by an emergent crisis within the Vandal Kingdom of Africa, but also a need to re-establish the credibility of Justinian's regime at home, reaching out to conservative critics who dreamt of a restoration of Roman power in the West, as well as church leaders who regarded the Vandal Kingdom of Africa as ruled over by Aryan heretics hell-bent on the persecution of the Orthodox faith. Rather, if we want to get to grips with Justinian's real priorities, as Roger Scott has argued, and as I would agree, we essentially need to set Procopius's history of the wars aside and turn instead to the evidence of the emperor's own personal actions and interventions as revealed by the other contemporary sources we have available to us. Viewed from that perspective, the emperor's overriding interests were not so much in the restoration of power to the West, but rather in the fields of law and the definition and propagation of the Christian faith as understood by the imperial church. To take law first, a topic that students tend to like avoiding and so often to many historians. There is sometimes a tendency for historians of the age of Justinian to associate the extraordinary legal creativity and activism of his reign primarily with the figure of Tribonia, who served as quaestor and who undoubtedly played a decisive role in the codification project, rescuing the codex after the initial recension of it had proved to be problematic, masterminding the compilation of the digest, and directing and editing the institutes. Tribonian presided over the last and perhaps the greatest efflorescence of Roman jurisprudence. And after his death in 542, imperial legislation diminished considerably in volume. But the contribution of Tribonian was informed above all by the fact that his extraordinary talent appealed to and chimed with the interests of the emperor. Thanks to the work of Brian Croak, we can now chart in detail Justinian's career prior to his <coughs> becoming sole emperor in 527 when he succeeded his elderly uncle Justin to the throne. For the preceding five months, Justinian had ruled with Justin as co emperor. Now, Contrary to how Procopius presented him in his secret history, Justin had never been lax when it came to matters of legislation. And the number of extant laws issued by per year during his reign is entirely comparable to the legal output under his predecessor Anastasius, who was regarded as a good administrator. Justin was also capable of making major, carefully targeted governmental interventions as and when necessary. When in the year 525, for example, much of the city of Antioch was destroyed by a devastating earthquake, Justin ordered that the vast sum of more than one third of a million solidi 
be assigned to the rebuilding of the city. This would have been equivalent to almost one half of all the money taxes uh, collected each year through taxation from Egypt, the fiscally most productive region of the empire as a whole. Left to his own devices, however, Justin was clearly not inclined to make significant legal innovations. In legal terms, he was a great believer in letting sleeping dogs lie. The rate of output and tone of Justin's legislation, however, can be seen to have changed dramatically once Justinian was appointed co-emperor, such as one third of all the laws we have for Justin's reign were issued in just those five months alone. Having spent almost nine years of his life watching his adopted father running the Roman state at a relatively leisurely pace, Justinian was clearly determined to speed things up. Here was a middle-aged man in a hurry, eager to finally make his mark. Indeed, Turning from reading the legislation of Justin to that issued under the joint names of Justin and Justinian is akin to being woken up from a light doze by somebody slapping you around the face and shouting at you. And once Justinian started shouting, he did not easily stop. In just one month after he became sole emperor, for example, Justinian issued more extant laws than his uncle had done in the entirety of his eight and a half year period of sole rule. And whilst Justin had issued some 30 extant laws from 519 to 527, during the first eight years of his reign, Justinian would issue over 400, to a great extent prior to the development of his working relationship with Trebonia. This initial wave of legislation addressed the full range of issues that had long concerned Roman emperors. The technicalities of the Roman law of marriage, inheritance, commercial exchanges and loans, property ownership, and the regulation of legal proceedings at court, to name but a few. But Justinian's initial legal focus, however, was overwhelmingly religious in nature. The first clearly dated law we have has survived from 528, forbade bishops from having children or grandchildren, and regulated the running of hospices, infirmaries, poorhouses, and orphanages under ecclesiastical care. It also cracked down on bribery to secure church appointments and complained to priests paying others to perform their duties for them. Justinian believed in the imperial church, but he was under no illusions as to the moral failings of many of its personnel. Six years later, in 534, for example, he would complain of bishops playing dice, betting on horses, and attending stage shows, as well as musical performances and boxing matches, when in fact he thundered. It behoves them to devote themselves to fasts, vigils, and the study of divine scriptures and prayers on behalf of his all. Justinian's initial religious ire, however, was overwhelmingly directed at heretics, Samaritans, Jews, and especially at this point, pagans. As Alan Cameron emphasised, emperors since the 4th century had passed increasingly draconian legislation seeking to prohibit pagan acts of worship. In an important law, probably issued in 529, Justinian, however, made it illegal not only to perform pagan rituals or rites, but even to be a pagan. Those who were found to have made only false or nominal conversions, from what he termed the insanity of the unholy pagans of Christianity, were to be, quote, subjected to the ultimate punishments, which, as Duval noted in Justinian's legislation, generally means death. Those who failed to convert uh, would be exiled. Those caught performing pagan rites could also be killed. This was the most extreme anti-pagan legislation that any Roman emperor had ever passed. This crackdown on religious nonconformists would further intensify in the 530s, as in his novels, Justinian extended the scope of his legislation against Christian dissidents and intensified the pressure on the empire's Jewish community. Crucially, Justinian decided to reclassify as heretics opponents of the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon of 451, dissidents whose orthodoxy he had quite recently accepted. Like pagans, Justinian decreed that Samaritans, heretics and Jews were to be banned from holding any post in the imperial administration or army, and important limitations were placed on their ability to receive inheritances or pass on property to non-Christian heirs, thus, as it were, providing uh, encouragement within the family 
for people to convert and pitting father against son and sibling against sibling. Nor could they own Christian slaves, teach or give evidence in court against Christians unless on behalf of and in the interests of the government. Ominously for his Jewish subjects, in the Codex Justinianus, Justinian had already dropped the provision in imperial law which had granted Judaism the status of a legally permitted religion. And his subsequent laws included measures aimed at sowing discord within the Jewish community and destabilizing relations between its members. Across the entirety of his legislation, Justinian effectively engaged in a concerted effort to recast the Roman Empire and transform it into what historians today would think of as a confessional state. The opening volume of the Codex Justinianus, in marked contrast to the Theodosian Code, had given pride of place to laws concerned with the most exalted trinity and the Catholic faith. It was only once the rights and concerns of the church had been addressed that the Codex proceeded to those of the state. Justinian sought to transform the Roman Empire into a state that was officially Christian not only in its ideology and official pronouncements, but also in terms of its interactions with its subjects. He progressively advanced the rights of those most lawful of the emperor's subjects who upheld the imperially sanctioned definition of the faith, whilst curtailing and applying steady downward pressure on the rights of religious and other minorities regarded as outsiders in, in what he referred to in one of his laws as the Orthodox Republic, the Orthodoxos Politeia. Under Justinian, the legal rights of the empire's citizens were increasingly determined by their officially reckoned degree of religious conformity. As a result, deliberate efforts were made to marginalize the heterodox and to treat heretics, Jews, Samaritans, and pagans as a sort of undifferentiated mass of second-class citizens, increasingly burdened with obligations rather than bearing rights. In the law of 537, which describes the empire as an orthodox republic, upper-class heretics, Samaritans, and Jews were henceforth to be subject to physical punishments, which had previously been reserved for only members of the Roman lower classes. As Justinian declared, the law allows city councillors numerous privileged exemptions, such as from being beaten, produced for punishment, or deported to another province, and innumerable others. These people are to enjoy none of them. Their status is to be one of disgrace, which is what they have desired for their souls as well. Crucially, as the late antique historian in the US, Norman Underwood, has emphasized, the legal and ecclesiastical sources also reveal that uh, officials known as church defenders, defensorias ecclesiae, were empowered to arrest, cross-examine, and torture individuals suspected of paganism, heresy, and immorality. In a law concerned with provincial administration dating from 535, such heretic hunting, as Justinian terms it, is alluded to in passing as a now entirely standard feature of life within the empire. These heresy hunters were, in effect, I would suggest, the forerunner of those who would characterize the world of later medieval Europe. In many ways, Justinian thereby effectively established and defined the ideological foundations of the Christian state, on which subsequent medieval rulers would build, delineating through his laws the overarching vision of a Christian society, presided over and disciplined by a pious monarch in which deviance and error were to be ruthlessly identified, extirpated, or suppressed. It is perhaps, it is perhaps uh, 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 revealing that the Acropolis of the city of Justiniana Prima, which Justinian ordered to be built near the site of his birth, was occupied not by a governor's residence or secular buildings, but by a cathedral and an episcopal palace. And also that this city seems to have functioned as a center for pilgrimage. Justinian's legislation is also uh, likely to have been a formative influence uh, on the emergent world of the early medieval caliphate, uh, 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 such as uh, Juan Coles and Paul Gertzelentin have recently been arguing, arguing for uh, the need to be more alert to the impact of Justinianic law on the political, religious, and legal culture of medieval Islam. Now, Justinian's uh, legal output, as I mentioned earlier, 
would appear to have gone into relative decline after the mid-540s. This may have been due to the death of Tribolian. It may have been due to a measure of, of institutional torpor resulting from the impact of the bubonic plague. Or it may have been because from around that time, the emperor's mind became increasingly preoccupied with matters of theology and doctrine. For the one interest that runs as an absolute uniting thread throughout the entirety of Justinian's career, including the period before he was emperor, is Justinian's personal interest in matters of Christology and his attempt to resolve the doctrinal disputes that divided the Imperial Church. Now, you may be relieved that I don't have time this evening to go through these efforts in detail. I must say I was surprised and relieved by the extent to which my editors have allowed me to discuss both theology and law in my book. But although Justinian's theological position would waver and evolve over time, his interest in addressing the doctrinal issues of his day was omnipresent. Even prior to ascending the imperial throne, for example, when he was simply the nephew or adopted son of a new emperor with no particular power at court, we see Justinian writing to Pope Hormisdas in Rome, attempting to engage him in discussion of theology, quoting St. Augustine to him, and even reassuring the Pope at one point that he regarded a statement recently made by the pontiff to be, quote, fully Catholic. It is hard to imagine that the tone adopted by the Illyrian guards officer towards the Holy Father would not have raised some eyebrows in the papal curia. After his accession to the throne, we see Justinian convening discussions between supporters and opponents of the Council of Chalcedon in 532, almost brokering a deal with the leading anti-Chalcedonian theologian Severus and his supporters before moving against them in the mid-530s, and then carefully preparing the theological groundwork for the Council of Chalcedon at, sorry, of Constantinople at 553, of which he would humiliate the hapless Pope Vigilius before imposing his own neo-Chalcedonian doctrine on the Church. But even after the moment of triumph in 553, Justinian continued to try to reach out to opponents of the Council of Chalcedon down into the 560s, when he engaged in discussion of controversial so-called Apathartist doctrine. As the court poet Chrysippus describes Justinian's successor, Justin II, to have declared him emperor after his death in 565, all his mind was fixed on heaven. Indeed, later in his life, and after the death of Theodora, Justinian had in certain respects adopted the persona of a Christian holy man. And as Abel Cameron has noted, in his account of Justinian's funeral, Charippus describes the emperor's corpse as if it were almost a holy relic. Now Justinian did not manage to bring peace to the imperial church. But as Philip Booth has recently emphasized, he did manage to drive from Episcopal office almost every opponent of imperial orthodoxy. This would be true even in Egypt, where resistance to the Council of Chalcedon had been at its fiercest. Likewise, whilst Justinian did not manage to extirpate non-Christians from the Roman state, he did manage to fundamentally redefine the contours of imperial society, just as he and his law commissioners had managed to recast the body of imperial law. With the benefit of historical hindsight, Justinian's Western Reconquest may appear to modern historians to have been relatively short-lived, and his efforts to shore up the fiscal foundations of the Roman state relatively unsuccessful. But is it right to judge him and his reign on the basis of the subsequent fate of these policies? I would suggest not. Twenty years ago, in my chapter in Cyril Mango's Oxford History of Byzantium, I wrote of Justinian that buffeted by plague, and frustrated by deeply entrenched social and religious realities, a reign that had promised so much ultimately ended in disappointment. I would not write those words now. For in terms of what mattered most to the emperor, law and theology, his legacy would endure. In particular, Justinian redefined how both imperial law and Christian doctrine would be received in the Middle Ages, and provided his successors to the throne of Constantinople, as I have said, with a model of active, pious rulership to which to aspire. As Cyril Mango put it, the Christian empire of Justinian remained for Byzantium, an ideal to be striven for, but never attained.
But I would suggest, even in Byzantium, it was primarily through his works, rather than by virtue of a direct memory of the emperor, Justinian's legacy would be most keenly felt. And it was arguably in the world of the Latin West, in the later Middle Ages, that Justinian's vision of a truly Christian society would be most fully and aggressively realized as Justinianic law acquired a new lease of life. In one crucial respect, this would prove to be bitterly ironic. For the tomb in which Justinian was laid to rest in the Church of the Holy Apostles upon his death in 565 was not ransacked, as one might imagine, by Mehmed the Conqueror, uh, 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 who destroyed the building after the Ottoman conquest of 1453. He also destroyed the equestrian statue of uh, Justinian, here depicted or remembered on a later Ottoman manuscript. Rather, Justinian's tomb had already been pillaged in 1204, when crusaders from the West sacked the city. The contemporary Byzantine author Nikitas Koniatis would describe the scene as the Westerners smashed open the imperial tomb. Finding that the corpse of the Emperor Justinian, he wrote, had not decomposed for the long centuries, they looked upon the spectacle as a miracle, but this in no way prevented them from keeping their hands off the tomb's valuables. In other words, the Western nations spared neither the living nor the dead, but beginning with God and his servants, they displayed complete indifference and irreverence to all. So to conclude, Overemphasis on Procopius and his military narratives, I would suggest, have long led historians to judge the legacy of Justinian unfairly by prioritizing his wars of conquest and their relatively short-lived success. Yet, as we have seen, Justinian's Western forays had always been primarily opportunistic. From the start, what had mattered most to the emperor had been the definition of orthodoxy and reform of the law and government. And in these two spheres of activity, his achievements would be of fundamental significance to the development of societies to both East and West. Now, this point has been appreciated by others. Drawing on Procopius's negative assessment of Justinian's reign, Edward Gibbon in the 18th century, when writing his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, had denounced Justinian for having been regulated not by the prudence of a philosopher, but rather by the superstition of a monk. But Gibbon was faced with the problem, however, that at least until the advent of the bubonic plague in the 540s, the history of Justinian's period as emperor had in many ways confounded Gibbon's overall narrative of decline. Under Justinian, the empire had expanded. The emperor's legal achievements were real. Even commerce and industry, Gibbon noted, had thrived. What Gibbon suggested had ultimately vitiated Justinian's legacy was a misplaced nostalgia and an ultimately destructive obsession with the Roman Empire of old. Instead, so in particular, the emperor's reverence for the past, a phrase which Justinian had used as a rhetorical justification for his legal reforms, had accentuated the emperor's own inner lack of creative genius. As Gibbon had concluded, instead of a statue cast in a single mould by the hand of an artist, the works of Justinian represent a tessellated pavement of antique and costly, but too often of incoherent fragments. But was this assessment fair? Not everyone has thought so. And the accusation of incoherence is, I think, particularly misconceived, as others have concurred. In 1949, for example, while actively engaged in Britain's withdrawal from empire and pondering how the newly rebranded British Commonwealth might yet be a force for good, the post-war Labour Prime Minister Clement Attlee was reading Gibbon's decline and fall. As he wrote to his brother Tom at the time, Attlee did not think Gibbon had quite got Justinian right. Rather, in the words of the Prime Minister's recent biographer, John Pugh, Attlee admired the Emperor's commitment to spreading the values of the Roman Empire, such as the rule of law to other nations, even as its territory and its military strength receded. Now, the values that Justinian spread and not necessarily our values. But the remarkable extent to which his influence has been felt across the world in societies both East and West in the 1500 years since he first ascended the throne of Constantinople, the sole emperor in 527, would suggest that Attlee had a point. Whether viewed as a holy emperor or a demon king, or a soldier or a saint, Justinian made a fundamental contribution to the world in which he lived 
and the historical societies that would emerge in its wake, including our own. For a message of my forthcoming book is that perhaps despite the many centuries that separate us from Justinian, this very ancient figure remains our contemporary. For as our recent experience of pandemics reminds us, many of the challenges that Justinian faced, and even some of the solutions with which he and those around him responded to them, continue to resonate. Above all, the emperor's legacy remains all around us. In the architecture inspired by his building program, of which the most beautiful and influential manifestation is surely still Hagia Sophia, in our legal systems, and in our culture and history through Justinian's fundamental contribution to both the formation of Christendom and the making of the Islamic world. As such, for all his complexity and contradictions, Justinian and the history of his reign continue to speak to us today, and students of history, both ancient and modern, I would suggest, still have much to learn from.